my lords, good morning. To round off the ground one arguments, I have a number of respondents and notice points for your lordships. Yeah. Uh, as a point of orientation, they can be seen in my respondents notice, which is at CB3, yeah. tab 22, page 3. There are three points which come from paragraphs 1b and c of, of that respondent's notice. The three points are, first, characterization as conspiracy to defraud the revenue, which is at b. Secondly, within c, the matters to be adjudicated upon. And thirdly, also within c, the use of public powers. If time permits, I can also say something briefly about 1A, the international instruments position, and relatedly the interorium argument that for this case to fall within Dicey Rule 3 is some sort of open invitation to fraudsters. Um, but both of those have largely been. I mean, they've really been covered by your predecessors from the start. But I'm grateful. You've got some devastating new point. I think we heard plenty about that yesterday. I I'm grateful for and The short answer is the Mars was a, a, a remedy that was available. So the sort of plea and trial room doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> exactly, my lord. Uh, 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 I'm grateful for the indication, and on that basis, whether time permits or otherwise, yeah, it's not an answer. It's not an answer for either of you. Indeed. I mean, if, if 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 Lord Panic is right, the fact that Mars was also available is neither here nor there. And if you're right, the fact that Mars is available and the Indians are availing themselves of it is neither here nor there as well. Uh, uh, my lord, I. I take that. I will, when, when, when I get to the end of everything else, not stray into that again for those reasons. Um, starting, my lords, then with characterization as conspiracy to defraud the revenue. Um, we have addressed this point, uh, and, and not necessarily to turn it up, but just so it's there for, for reference in due course, uh, at paragraph 62 to 65 of our skeleton, uh, which is CB4 26, page 20. Stepping back for a moment, I should say. Stepping back for a moment, I should say that characterization is important and necessary, because one does not flit in and out of Dicey Rule 3, depending on exactly what cause of action is chosen, or how a foreign revenue chooses to frame the case. Nor is whether the case is within the rule a matter of free choice for the foreign revenue as to how it puts the case. And my understanding is that that, so far, that it's a question of characterization, is common ground with, with SCAT, that central to ground one is this question of characterization as to which side of the line the claim falls. Uh, as SCAT puts it in their skeleton, their paragraph 65, whether SCAT's claims fall within Dicey Rule 3.1 is a question of characterization of the substance of the claims brought. The exercise, therefore, inherently requires asking what sort of case any given claim is or I should say what its true nature is for the purpose of the rule. And so, whether it is within a class of claims which the court is required to decline to decide. As your lordships know, the identification of which claims are within the rule has been put in the cases in three relevant ways. Exercise or assertion of sovereign right, the Embasogo analysis, <coughs> enforcement direct or indirect of Danish revenue law, the government of Taylor and India case law, or thirdly, enforcing a foreign governmental interest or the interests of a foreign sovereign, uh, whether the central interest underlying the claims is a governmental one, and that final one was the approach of the High Court of Australia in the spy catcher case, which as your lordships know was approved by the Privy Council um, in the Equatorial Guinea case which was the precursor of the Embasogo decision. In my submission, those are all different ways of expressing or trying to capture 
the same core question of where the rule is engaged. And however it is put, or whichever analytical route is taken, the first step is always the characterization of the action. And when I step back and look at this case and ask what its overall true nature is, it is, on Stat's part, an alleged conspiracy to defraud the Danish revenue. That is my pleaded case on the character of the action in paragraph 173.1 of my client's defense, which for your lordship's record, but we don't need to look at, is CB2 10.4 at page 78, where we said the reality of this claim was that all of it can be characterized as claims for concerted conduct to cheat the Danish revenue. It is also, as set out in our skeleton, paragraph 56, how, for example, the Internal Revenue Service of the United States saw it. And we say that's a straightforward and accurate description of the case. Seeing the claims as conspiracy claims would also fit the analysis in cases such as Buchanan and McVeigh and Franson. Although not put as such in those cases, they effectively involve concerted action to ensure that a revenue does not receive its funds. We say that would be far and away the simplest and most direct way for SCAT to plead this action. Can, uh, I, can I just ask you this? Uh, when, you, when you give that characterization of uh, concerted course of conduct to cheat the Danish revenue, are you referring to every single claim or are you simply referring to the solo claims? Um, e every single claim because concerted course of conduct to cheat the revenue sounds like an allegation of fraud to me. Um, well, I'm not going to stray into, for, for the purpose of these submissions, into the EDNF man um, position, if that's... So you're, 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 you're dealing with the ground one appellants? Indeed, my lord. Okay. Yes. It's a conspiracy to defraud, is what you're saying. Yes, my lord. Exactly, yes. Okay. Right. Yes. I, do, I just wanted to be clear that you weren't straying into the mm. territory of other claims. Your Lordship's right, and if, I, if my first answer to Your Lordship's question was not clear enough in that regard, uh, then I apologise, and my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips, is exactly right when he says that um, I'm referring, uh, and Your Lordship too, that I'm referring to the, uh, uh, the ground one appellant for these purposes. So the last thing you said before my Lord's question, uh, to get the transcript up in case I haven't got through, um, was to the effect that this was a, a conspiracy to stop the revenue receiving, or to stop the revenue receiving the tax duty. It will ensure that the revenue does not receive its funds. Right. I don't understand that because the revenue had received its funds, and this was just this was taking money from the revenue in the same way that somebody who went in and helped itself to lots of coins would be depriving it of its revenue. It already received. Well, it may help if, my Lord, if, I, if I fill out how I put the conspiracy to defraud allegations and the way they fit with what we say amounts to enforcement of Danish tax law, so, so as to bring us within the rule. Okay, one, thing, one thing I don't think that's being grappled with here, and I'm not sure anyone has so far really focused on, is that the first thing I say in the characterization is that this is not, this is not a claim for... Um, sums due uh, um, de novo or as an originating claim, this is a claim for repayment. And that's the first, I think, important thing in characterization. So we, we have to look in characterizing it as, as what is it what is it that the that SCAT is saying gives right to the the right to repayment. Um, they're not saying here you owe us tax or you have you have conspired to prevent us getting tax. They're saying you've got some money which you which you shouldn't have got. And so I think in characterizing, we then have to say, well, why have they got? Why are they saying they're entitled to repayment? And then the answer to that is not because they were defrauding the tax. 
not because they were cheated out of tax. The characterization is there was a fraudulent representation which caused them to pay money to these persons, which they weren't entitled to, they say, on any basis, tax or otherwise. Uh, that seems to me the fundamental characterization which has to be grappled with. Uh, I, I'm grateful to your Lordship for the question because it gives me the opportunity, uh, if I may say so, to differ from your Lordship in relation to how that characterization works. Yeah. And, and indeed I have to um, for the purposes of uh, my client's case in this appeal. And, and if I may, I dif differ from it in two respects. First, in the respect that your Lordship says it's not a claim for tax or a question of tax. And, and those were the submissions that my learned friend, Mr. Beale, was addressing to your Lordships yesterday, by which he seeks to persuade your Lordship, and with which I entirely respectfully agree and adopt, that it is a claim for tax and can be framed as a claim for tax. And the fact that um, uh, uh, SCAT has chosen to put it in the way that it has, rather than by way of an assessment of tax, should not, from a characterization perspective, um, change the uh, answer to this appeal. Why not? Because uh, uh, whether you um, uh, 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 claim tax as a, uh, which way round you claim tax, whether it's from a refund perspective or from a... Well, that's a critical question. Well... Because if my lord is right, then it, it, isn't, it, it isn't a case of a claim for tax or a claim for repayment of tax. They have a tax. If, if it had, assuming there was a fraud, if it had it not been for the fraud, the, the scout would have quite happily had all the tax they, that, that they were entitled to, the 27%. It was only because the defendants came along and fraudulently uh, induced them to pay, to, to repay money they weren't entitled to. It wasn't in fact a repayment at all. It was actually just a, a payment out in the same way as if, as, as if um, uh, the, uh, the fraudsters had, had, as it were, broken in and stolen the money from the safe. Again, my lord, that's, if I may, the point of distinction that, that, that arises, because we all agree in this case, I think, that um, robbing the safe or hijacking the armoured vehicle is outside of the rule. Um, and the submission is on this, this case falls on the other side of that line. How can you repay tax which hasn't been paid? Well, the, the, um, the collection of tax at the uh, withholding stage by the state of Denmark it is, um, it is collecting tax on as an at source of the obligation of the of shareholders and dividend holders. And, and none of it relates to the fraudulent, the fraudulent applicants. It does in this respect. When the um, uh, the solo applicants, the WHT applicants, apply to the Danish revenue and ask for a tax refund, they put themselves within the Danish tax system. And the Danish tax system rules at that juncture that they are indeed Danish taxpayers. But this starts with a lie. This starts with a lie, which is we paid tax and please can we have it back? It's just untrue. But it's it, it, it's untrue only at the stage. It's a it's a. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no. Well, I, I understand why your lordship wants to press me on this. Um, but, but it it raises the question of the status of the decisions of SCAT as a revenue body until the point at which it revokes them. So I understand your Lordship no, no, might... Give me the, but that, I, can see that, that I can see that the applicants might not be able to deny that they were taxpayers. And they, may, they might find themselves subject to the rules because they have, they have made application as a taxpayer. But that's not the, the same position as, a, as, the, as the victim of the fraud. They're not bound by characterization of a taxpayer if that is a is a fraudulent ca characterization except that's like, that's, forgive me that's like the forger of the check saying well I'm I, I'm I'm entitled to be treated as the, the payee of the check it, it's different in this sense because once one gets into the governmental sphere the decision that the applicant is a taxpayer the decision that it's entitled to a refund the decision as to whether that refund is going to be cancelled again all of that stands up as a, a valid and enforceable government decision until such point as the government decides to revoke it. It has public law status. None of that arises in the Czech case. It's not all void. I understand your Lordship's phrase from uh, previous days has been written water. But it's not. It's, it's voidable, as it were, rather than void. It's not a nullity or nothing. 
Well, they have voided it now by bringing it's, this But it's a precursor or a precondition to that, to, to bringing the claim that they bring. It's not part of the claim. But it, because if they hadn't revoked the decision, your, the, your clients would be saying, oh, well, you paid us the money and, and you made a decision and you haven't revoked it. So they had to revoke the decision to get themselves in a position to be able to make the claim to, to recover the money. And what neither Mr. Jones nor Mr. Beale showed us when we were looking at those documents or refer, specifically referred to were the very clear words in there that, that, they, that these defendants didn't own any shares and didn't receive any, didn't receive any dividends. But, but the whole exercise on which the English court would then be uh, engaged is deciding whether those decisions by the yeah. Danish tax bodies to revoke its determinations that these were valid reclaims would be a decision to be reviewed and taken by the English court uh, as to whether any of that's right. Uh, and we say that in itself infringes the rule because those decisions, that approach to whether the Danish revenue has got it right or not um, as to whether they're taxpayers, they will say, of course, that, that the applications are entirely valid, is an inquiry that the rule doesn't suggest that this court, uh, the English court, by which I mean, is, is entitled to pursue or consider that course. The, the foundation of your submission is that the first thing that the Danish government does is to repay tax. And I would still like an answer to my question, how do you repay tax to someone who hasn't paid it? Well, the, on the, um, on the um, analysis, and this is what the validity trial would have gone to or would go to, on the analysis of the defendants, they are valid tax reclaims because they are valid taxpayers and the scheme by which the applications were made all works as a matter of Danish tax law. And if that premise is, is accepted, then... Uh, and I'm not asking your lordships to form a, a view on that, obviously you cannot in, in these circumstances, but if, if those validity positions are correct, and in fact the, the, the WAPT applications work as a matter of Danish tax law, then that's exactly what the refund is. I, I thought that, the, I thought that the, um, the rule prevented the enforcement of um, foreign tax but I didn't think there was any bar on the English court considering uh, the, the, the question of foreign legislation or, or indeed whether or not the tax had previously been paid, which it seems to me is the, the question, what the investigation would be. Um, maybe I've misunderstood the scope, but the, the, the prohibition is on, on enforcement. Well, the, the conception of the rule jurisprudentially, uh, in my submission, is not entirely clear um, from the cases. And one gets the different characterizations as to whether it's a rule of admissibility, a rule of denuding a cause of action, whether it is a substantive defense. Um, and, uh, and different courts have, have considered it in different ways. And if the conception of the rule is that only you can apply it effectively once you get to the end of proceedings, and you decide... The, the question of whether or not this is a claim to tax and enforcement of tax has to be determined. So you, you can't just say, well, because it would require you to investigate whether or not this is a claim to tax, then you can't investigate. You can't do that investigation. And you're, 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 you're taking it back a stage further. You're saying not only can we not enforce tax, but the English court can't even consider whether or not it can enforce the tax, whether or not this is a situation where it shouldn't enforce the claim. And that's the approach, for example, of Learned Hand in the Moore and Mitchell case of uh, the court does not pass on, on tax matters. Um, and well, we've got to decide whether it is a tax matter. But, but that's, uh, the, that's the whole point, isn't it? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. You're going to your point about a validity trial. I mean, the validity trial would, would have determined uh, whether, in fact, your clients were legitimate taxpayers or whether they were fraudsters. I thought that this and if they were fraudsters, which is how we have to proceed, because this has been dealt with by way of preliminary issue, then the argument is, the argument is um, that this isn't about tax at all, because they never were taxpayers, legitimate taxpayers, and they never they never were liable to pay any tax, and never did pay any tax. They simply abstracted money from. It happens to have been the, the revenue, but it might just as well have been the Danish Ministry of Agriculture. 
And this is where, um, in my submission, the conspiracy to defraud angle helps your lordships. And, and if I develop it a bit further, I'll try and explain why. Because um, it, 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 um, uh, uh, it's, a, in my submission, an orthodox and classic understanding of the rule that um, conspiracies to defraud revenues are uh, within the rule. Now, if that's right, you don't get to the stage of having to make the determinations or the assumptions that your lordships assume you get to at the end of the piece. And in my submission, if one can only approach this issue on the basis that you've got to the end of the telescope and you've already decided there are uh, no taxpayers uh, and everyone is a fraudster, which of course the defendants will deny, then the preliminary issue did not have the ability to effectively resolve the case. The notion of the case that I wish to present to your lordships is that there is a, a rationale and a conception of the rule that means that cases which amount to conspiracies to defraud revenues are effectively on the sovereign side of the line or the determination of tax issues side of the line, the enforcement of Danish revenue rules that the court does not entertain. Sure, it's got to be a conspiracy to defraud the revenue in relation to revenue, rather than rather than a conspiracy to defraud, which would be the same analysis if it was a conspiracy to defraud a private individual, i.e., to 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 uh, deceive them into giving you money out of their pockets, which uh, they were not uh, which you were not entitled. I agree with and, has to, and the conspiracy has to, which takes us right back into the question, is it, is it a conspiracy to um, deprive the revenue of tax? It's a, the, 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 perhaps the distinct... If, if, Mr, um, if Mr. Buchanan had been in, in cahoots with a whole load of other people, so there was a conspiracy, that would have been a conspiracy to defraud the revenue, because the whole point of his fraud was that he was seeking to evade a tax liability which he had in respect to tax which he hadn't paid. And the claim that was brought by the liquidator in the King was not right. It was a claim to, to recover, in effect, to recover the tax that he hadn't paid. Um, conceptually, one understands that. That's, that's within the rule. But where I think all three of us are struggling is seeing how this, this claim is, can be said to be within the rule merely by categorising as a conspiracy on the Danish revenue. Uh, and I understand your Lordship's question, and my answer to, to your Lordship and to my Lord Lord Justice Phillips is that the dividing line between the two cases is whether the, the defrauding conduct is by way of the revenue legislation and the revenue rules of the foreign state, as in this case, which is one side of the line, and I'll try and explain that a bit further in a moment, or whether it's an entirely private fraud on the other side of the line, such as could be committed against and perpetrated against any other private individual in the world. And this fraud is incapable of being, uh, this alleged fraud, is in, if your lordships are assuming it's a fraud, is incapable of being um, uh, 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 perpetrated against anyone other than SCAT, is incapable of being perpetrated other than by way of SCAT's administrative, public law, legislative decisions, which in order for relief to be granted against the defendants requires all of that to be unwound, and all of that unwinding to be upheld and enforced by this court. And that's what I say is the difference. Um, and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and that's why um, we refer to conspiracy to defraud the revenue as identifying what the appellant is really trying to allege in this case. We say that both accurately describes the claim and puts it firmly within the revenue rule, and, and that that's consistent with uh, uh, and if uh, 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 with conspiracy claims such as are shown by Emma Sogo and by the Lord Collins uh, article in the Law Quarterly Review, which your lordships were shown yesterday, which I won't, won't take your lordships back to, uh, and I understand the debate about how far one can take that article uh, and what its status is for, you, for, 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 for your lordships. But the submission I'm effectively making to your lordships this morning is no different from the view of Lord Collins in that article. So it is not, uh, and I understand why your lordships, uh, 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 when fraud is raised, um, why the judicial eyebrow is raised, 
um, as to um, where the boundary of the, the rule may lie. But I can't, in order to present this appeal, shy away from the fact that what I'm effectively saying to your lordships is uh, that where someone comes along uh, and um, uh, uh, um, has defrauded the revenue um, in the way, by way of the use of that revenue's tax gathering and tax paying powers, um, that, that, that the revenue rule provides people in that position with a complete answer in this court. So that would include somebody who simply um, wrongly puts forward that they are shareholder A. Uh, yes, if, if in order to do so, they um, uh, utilise SCAT's forms and get SCAT's decisions and all the rest, absolutely. So it's just simply an absolutely false and fraudulent assertion that they are A, they fill in all the forms, um, it all goes through, and the result is SCAT pays A, when in fact the sum would have been used B. Yes. And they have no claim against, they, they can't bring a claim against here in, in England and Wales uh, because it's a revenue claim. Exactly. And I say that that's the orthodox conception of the rule, exactly as... Uh, that's that. not what Mr Justice and the paper. No, and that's why, my lord, this is a respondent's latest point, effectively. Um, but he was he, wrong to say his mistaken identity was different. Yes, my lord. For, for, so a mistake such as was posited yesterday, I think it was, such as you scat... Um, in paying the refund accidentally puts the wrong numbers into the computer so it goes into the wrong account. That, in my submission, would not be a revenue claim. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think on, on, on the logic of your submission, it would be. Well, it's still using the same forms of the same system. So if it's, I mean, I, I think the logic of your case is if the fraud or the mistake is within the tax system used by the Danish revenue, then it's any claim relating to it Anything to do with that is is verboten in this court. That's that's effectively that's a, your a genuine. Forgive me. Say so it's a genuine claim by a shareholder. Only unfortunately, they they put on the form they put the wrong digit down in their bank account number. The result of that is it goes through the system. But the payments all actually go to the wrong person because um, through mistake they put the wrong number. My understanding is that must, on your analysis, mean that, that SCAT cannot claim that uh, payment by mistake from the recipient. Mm. Um, uh, I, I would, uh, I think it, it, where I would draw the line is, is somewhat different because the, the cause of action there, nothing in relation to that mistake involves um, uh, sovereign decisions or um, uh, the way the tax system works for enforcing the legislation. Why is this? What, what makes it not a sovereign decision in that case? Um, why, is the, <coughs> why is the decision to pay to that bank account mistakenly any different from the decision to pay to that fraudster who has deceived you? In both cases, you, in both cases, you exercise your sovereign authority to pay that person under a, a, a belief which is vi which is vitiated, whether by mistake or by. Yeah. Uh, fraud. But both, it's exactly the same process. Except that in the case of the purest mistake of a missed number, it doesn't bring into the form of this court for enforcement or determination any issue of uh, validity or whether the tax rules have been correctly applied or anything to enforce. It's simply no, it's as if, if it's just a straightforward, I'm A, I want your money. In my submission, if it's just a fraud, like this like this fraud. I mean, the issue, the issue is going to be an issue of the fact, isn't it? Were were your clients taxpayers or not? Well, in, in the case of my particular, client, they say that they, they, they. Well, I say your clients, but I mean, were the were the um the defendants other than the EDF man defendants? Were they taxpayers? Can, can they say that they were taxpayers or not? And on, on the conception of the rule, and I'm, I'm conscious that um, uh, 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 I need to allow time for ground two, but on the conception of the rule that, that, that I offer to your lordships, um, the, um, uh, 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 um, one doesn't get to the need to make those final determinations of fact, because one, if one characterises the claim at the outset in the way that I invite your lordships to do so, that tells you at the beginning which side of the line the case falls. 
Uh, and anyway, I think we've I think we've now got the submission loud and clear from a number of you, so I think that's all sensible. We can move on. I, I will, my lord, um, and I will. I think um, uh, take everything else um, extremely briefly, and perhaps by commending my um, written submissions um, to your lordships, just in, in terms of um, uh, the need for ground to be properly developed. But can I'm I? I'm just conscious that we have got quite a lot of work ground to cover. Mm -hmm. Your Lordship is quite right. But can, can I just explain in one minute, um, yeah. uh, uh, to finish it, why I say that that conspiracy to defraud the revenue claim <coughs> falls within within the rule by way of the analysis that I seek to offer your Lordships? Because that's really my central point in burden for this morning. And everything else I will tell your Lordship by, by your Lordships by reference to the written submissions, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the way I put that, it, it can be um, taken by way of the principal point that's taken against me by SCAT, which is in their skeleton, CB4 29, page 5, at paragraph 12. They say there cannot be a conspiracy for the WHD applicants to violate the Danish tax law because the primary statutory provision, which Mr. Beale showed your lordships yesterday, mm -hmm. section 69B of the Danish Withholding Tax Act, sets out the conditions for SCAT to pay a refund and obliges it to pay a refund following a valid, a valid application. They say the only obligation in the Danish tax regime is on SCAT, and therefore the defendants cannot have conspired to contravene that legislation or the Danish tax rules. That's the case against me in this regard, to which we say if they didn't act illegally or conspire to act illegally in the context of the Danish tax rules, there would be no claim at all. We say it's the essence of the claims alleged that, that, that WHT claims were made, which are said knowingly not to fall within that regime. And that Section 69B therefore sets out mandatory preconditions, and their cases that applications, the appellants' cases, that applications were made which don't comply with those preconditions. We say that's an allegation of effectively a breach of Danish law. Uh, and if you look at each and every claim in this case, each and every one requires that allegation of concerted action to contravene uh, Danish uh, tax rules. Um, and in, we say in circumstances where um, it, 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 it's common ground that there is a rule and it precludes liability in some cases, and those cases include fraud cases, then um, in this case, what the English court would have to do is determine, apply, and enforce Danish tax rules, Danish tax legislation, section 69b, and whether that rule, that legislation was properly complied with or not. And so to, to sum that submission up, we say it cannot be right to say the making of a decision that a tax refund is or is not due is nothing to do with tax. The action asks the court to review, determine, and decide the Danish WHT scheme how it worked, whether it allowed the refunds in issue or not. It puts the court in the position of deciding how to operate the Danish tax rules and then to give them effect. And we say, therefore, that is a claim trying to enforce Danish tax law, uh, which is that being the very foundation of the claim uh, is exactly what the revenue rule serves to make <coughs> impermissible. Can I just ask you one question? I know you want to move on, but you prefaced that submission, or you included in that submission, that the Danish Act obliges SCAT to pay a refund following a valid application. If we are operating on the basis that we're asked to operate, namely that these applications were fraudulent by non-taxpayers, would you describe that as a valid application? I would describe the process of determining whether it's a valid de determination or not as enforcing that Danish tax rule. And therefore, the premise that your lordship puts to me, I say, is one that uh, properly conceived on the conception of the rule does not arise. Because that very determination of who is a taxpayer, whether they fall within the rules, whether their application falls within section 69b or not, inherently entails enforcing section 69b if it's a conspiracy to defraud the revenue by way of that piece of legislation. And I say this, the English court is not entitled to do that under the law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I promised my lords, um, unless there are any further questions on that, that I would um, uh, take my other points by way of the written submissions. 
Um, and so on the second of my respondents, notice points the, being the issues in the case and how they are a touchstone to demonstrate what the case is really about and what the court would have to decide. That would be paragraphs 49 to 52 of our skeleton, which was at CB 426. Um, and in relation um, to the third point on our respondents' notice, the use of public powers, that's fifth pet paragraphs um, 53 um, to 61 of, of, of our skeleton. Uh, and although I don't have time, I'm afraid to develop these points <coughs> with your lordships already, they do form um, part of my case for these purposes, if I can put it like that. Um, and given um, my lord the chancellor's indication at the beginning in relation to any further points I promised I would not make, unless I can assist your lordships further, those were my submission. Thank you very much, Mr. I'm grateful. It's very helpful. Thank you. May I just pass this over to you? My lords, um, I'm going to start off by asking this question why are we here? Um, <laughs> and uh, then to deal with the concession, and then to say something about preclusion and the question about revenue Mr. Palmer's going to deal with. First question, why are we here? Um, as your lordships know, ground one is not being run against my client. What does that mean? It means that it's accepted, subject to the Brussels point, that this claim should be dismissed by virtue of Dicey Law 3. So it's over. Um, so we're only then left with the question as to whether we're basically brought back in as a result of a, a rule of uh, under Brussels, um, and, as a, and, and it is said that as, effect, as a result of Brussels, um, Dicey Rule 3 is effectively gone, um, doesn't exist. Uh, and that's basically what the case is about. And, and to put it bluntly, if, if your lordships can just put on this, if they can put on the screen um, Dicey uh, paragraph 522, which um, is uh, at uh, PA uh, 11 tab 1054, if that could be put on the screen. Yeah. And th that is the, uh, the very bottom where there's a discussion of having explained <coughs> whether there's a rule of jurisdiction, uh, uh, but it says this, this rule is not affected by Brussels 1 regulation. And then if you can just go over the page, you can see what's said there. Uh, and um, there is a point about whether this is a rule of jurisdiction or a substantive rule of law, but it's common ground uh, that it isn't about jurisdiction, it's about admissibility. So if we can just go back one page, so the question that concerns me is whether that is, is right, whether the rule is not affected by Brussels 1 regulation. Uh, and that's basically the point that concerns me. Just over the page, the next sentence is, the claim was a revenue matter within the meaning of the Brussels Convention. And the rule that the English yeah. court would not directly or indirectly enforce the revenue laws of the country was not overridden by the Convention. Have I misunderstood that? I thought that was saying, <coughs> the issue which we're addressing in ground two didn't arise because there was no conflict between Brussels and the rule. Yeah, so that, that's, a, two, that's a reference to France and which I'll come to. There are two, two points, aren't there? One is, um, once you decide that it's within rule, uh, once it's accepted that it's within the revenue rule for the purposes of the claim against your client, how can it be said that it's anything other than a revenue matter that's for the separate. purposes of Brussels? That's, that's point one, one point, yes. And the second point is, if that's wrong and it's a civil or commercial matter, then is... is, is rule 3, is, does it go? Is, is it inconsistent with... Effectively our, yeah. inconsistent with Brussels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in my submission, the answer is clearly no. I mean, I, speaking for myself, and we haven't heard your submissions yet, I find the first point um, pretty straightforward because it seems to me counterintuitive to suggest that it's not a revenue matter. Correct, and, that, and that's what the more my difficult point is. The second point, as, as to whether it, whether it is the case that, that the effect of Rule Three 
is is to derogate from yep. uh, a, a what is effectively a mandatory jurisdiction regime. Exactly, uh, and and, and the answer is that the, the the answer the short answer is no, yeah. because they're dealing with different matters. Yeah. One Brussels is dealing with jurisdiction. Rule three is not about jurisdiction. It's about admissibility. It's about substantive law, uh, and there's no inconsistency. Uh, one is about courts, and which court can you sue, yeah. which is jurisdiction. Admissibility is about the claim. And, and your lordship probably familiar with this debate that's been going on in relation to Article 67 of the Arbitration Act about jurisdiction and admissibility. I, I recall your, your lordship attended a, a, a seminar, I think, that Professor Merkin was, was giving about Emirates trading. And the point being there as to whether or not if there is a provision in an agreement saying, for example, you cannot arbitrate unless you've gone through a calling off process, is that a matter going to jurisdiction, which is what Mr. Justice Tear said in Everett's trading. But there have now been, I think, two, well, two cases which says that that is, is not, in fact, jurisdiction. It's about admissibility. And the distinction in those cases is between matters that go to the court, in other words, where, where can you sue, and then the question is to, as to the claim, and that's the distinction. The distinction between jurisdiction and admissibility is essentially that about uh, about the, 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 the does it go, is it an issue going to the court or the tribunal, or is it a matter going to the claim? And in our, in our respectful submission, although it is the case that people have formulated Rule 3 as a rule of jurisdiction, it clearly is not a rule of jurisdiction, and, and that was common ground and is recorded uh, in the uh, agreed propositions uh, before Mr. Justice Andrew Baker uh, at, at uh, 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 paragraph 17.1, I think it is. So it's common ground that this is not about jurisdiction. And that perhaps is where one might say, if one was rewriting Dicey and Morris, which of course we're not doing, but the point is that as a formulated as a rule of jurisdiction, it clearly is not a rule of jurisdiction. Rule 3 says it's a rule, of, uh, formulated as a rule of jurisdiction. And as, and as you can see in the passage that um, is referred to, I think if we just go back a page uh, mm -hmm. on the screen, you can see that, that, um, that um, just above the passage I read, but it says, in view of the wide acceptance in judicial des decisions, Rule 3 has been retained in its traditional form. Uh, but but it, it, it is uh, not about jurisdiction. And that's obviously a very important point, and which, in my respectful submission, is the complete and the complete short answer to this point in terms of Article uh, uh, 1A, 1.1 uh, uh, of Brussels and Rule 3. They're dealing with different matters. Uh, Brussels is dealing about where you can sue and Rule 3 is dealing with the question about substantive law. It's a substantive defence. It's a substantive rule of law. So if, and if, if you're right, not, not that this should influence our decision in any way at all, if you're right, they can't sue here because of Rule 3, but is it also right that they, can't, they couldn't, for example, bring proceedings in Denmark because of Article 1? No. I'm not, I'm not dealing with the question of, of, of where, whether they could. It obviously depends on what the rules are in, in Denmark in terms of whether they can ex accept yeah. things. But, it, but, it, but in, 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 in my submission, um, the point is, is that they certainly can't sue here. Whether and what they can do in, in Denmark is obviously a matter uh, uh, for the Danish courts to decide as to whether they will <coughs> take jurisdiction under uh, one of the exceptions in relation to torts or whatever. But in my respectful submission, the, the, the key point here is that we have not lost Rule 3 as a result of Brussels. And you can test it this way. So when, when, we, when the accession uh, uh, treaty, uh, the question of accession was being discussed, it went to the, the Slosser report specifically was aware of this rule and was dealing with the question about what the implications were of joining and the only thing that was referred to was um, in relation to forum non-convenience and a couple of other things as well. Domicile, I think, was one, uh, and, and the, the, there was a third one as well. But the idea that Rule 3 is gone 
And if we're talking about revenue, but it's gone for everything, in my respectful submission, is a very surprising uh, proposition and is not supported by anything. The idea that rule three of Dicey has been lost as a result of, of Brussels. And in my respectful submission, when, when Dicey says this rule is not affected by Brussels one regulation, that is clearly correct. And just to put in terms of, the, uh, of, of this particular passage, um, although Lord Collins is the overall editor and therefore has overall responsibility, your lordships may recall that individual chapters have individual responsibility. Chapter five is Lord Collins again. Uh, and in my respectful submission, and this is my big picture point, the, 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 the point I make here is that, is that having been effectively uh, let out, or rather having it now being accepted that this claim, it should be dismissed on the basis it's inadmissible as a result of, of rule three. We say there are two consequences. The first consequence, which I think Mr. Well, well, Mr. Palmer is going to be de dealing with, that gets carried through into the question of whether this is revenue versus civil commercial. Yeah. So for all the reasons, that's the first proposition uh, that's going to be dealt with in a moment. But I also contend that there is nothing to suggest that Rule 3 has gone as a result of, of Brussels 1. And of course, the implications are big, because Rule 3 covers a number of other things, well, including that, that, that's Act of State and the like. Well, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because if you start thinking about um, uh, the Equatorial Guinea case, I mean, on this hypothesis, um, if the defendant was, a, was a, um, an EU national, then um, Rule 3 will have gone, so, so the English court will be obliged to take jurisdiction or to yeah. deal with that dispute, despite the fact that one of the reasons why it was not prepared to do so is because it involved trespassing on issues of... of um, Sovereign interest. Yeah, I mean, what, 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 from the supplemental skeleton of, of, of SCAP, the, their answer to that is to say, well, this is not civil or commercial. Uh, the, the, that, that's their answer. Therefore, it's not within Brussels, to which we say, well, if it's not civil or commercial in that case, well, why does it apply to our case? Um, and, and that's obviously a point that, that we rely on. But yeah. the implication, I think this is the, the big picture point is this, is that the implication that having left Brexit, we now find ourselves in the, for the first time effectively having lost Article 3 uh, as a result of, of something that by stealth, because it's, no one has ever suggested in my respectful submission that, that, that Rule 3 is, is lost as a result of, of, of Article 1.1. Well, the only, the only authority which actually directly d deals with it, albeit over three, is France. Exactly. says it isn't. Exactly. But when one looks at France, you can, your, your lordship will, will remember that, of course, in, in France, um, those obiter remarks do not c uh, uh, contemplate, in fact, the opposite, because the remarks of, of Lord Justice Simon Brown, they're premised on the assumption that the case is caught by the rules are necessarily revenue matters, and therefore outside Brussels. Mm. So um, respectfully agree with what my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips said about walking on water uh, when that point was made. Um, Franson doesn't help at all. I mean, Franson is the best case, uh, but we'll come to Franson in a moment. Yeah. That's, so that's all I wanted to say by way of overview in terms of awareness of the kind of implications of what this argument is. Uh, and the direct challenge well, on what is said. There's a faint irony in this court being invited effectively to, to give um, uh, a over, overarching power, if you like, to the Brussels regulation. Well, it's, it's in, more... In circumstances where we've actually left Europe, but the fact is that as a consequence of the, of the terms of the withdrawal agreement, that's what we're obliged to do if that's the position. Well, I put it slightly different. I agree with... Um, your Lordship's remarks, but it's slightly different. I mean, we've gone through the heartache of cases like Turner and Grovit, a Wusu, uh, uh, Tankers, West Tankers, and we're now coming in, having left with a new uh, uh, proposition, which is that um, uh, all our rules uh, in, in Rule 3, which encompass a number of rules, not just the revenue, but, but Act of State uh, and, and other related issues, 
have effectively been lost as a result of, uh, of Brussels I, when that was never contemplated when we joined, uh, and that proposition is not supported by anything um, other than the dicta um, in France, and which, as I've said, were premised on the basis that, that what was necessarily happening in that case was a revenue matter, which was the first point that your Lordship men mentioned. But let me deal with the question of the, the concession and the facts. Um, the concession was made um, some time ago, because as your Lordship know, knows, permission to appeal was not granted against uh, my clients on ground one. It was not sought uh, from the Court of Appeal. And so, um, although my Lord, Lord Justice Stuart Smith mentioned about reserving a position for, for later courts, as far as uh, my client is concerned, it's game over. Um, if, you know, if I may say something, I was simply trying to understand what was and was not being said yesterday Fine. when, when, we, when my Lord pressed as to where we were, yeah. which I did not, for my, entirely for my, speaking entirely for myself, did not find easy to follow. No, it's, it, it, was, in, it, it was incoherent. Um, and um, I don't mean that in a, in a rude sense, because the, the problem they had is that, <laughs> the, is that if, they gave a, if they gave an explanation as to why they'd made the concession, everyone else would be jumping on that and saying, well, that applies to me as well. Why is, why is EDF man coming out? That applies to me. So instead of exactly explaining what the reason is, they said, well, they've, they've done it. I mean, it pragmatic, might be pragmatic. Pragmatic, whatever that means. So it's pragmatic to drop ground one, but they pragmatic to continue ground two. It, it doesn't make any sense in relation to a claim which is which is said to be seventy million pounds. Um, and in my in my submission, um, that was the problem that we're, they were facing because if they gave a reason, then it was going to be used to get them. So they didn't give any reason. I mean, as far as my client is concerned. Um, it's as good as they, if they came to you and said, well, we walked past the little mermaid in Copenhagen who said, drop the claim against EDF man, or it's my birthday. I mean, it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> the, the reality is, is that the claim has, has gone against my client. It doesn't matter what the reason is. As far as my client is concerned, it may, may affect other parties as well. But as far as my client's concerned, the reason for the concession doesn't matter. Um, but what we do say, is that when it comes to looking at the two issues that I'm concerned with, the first one is the question of the preclusion. Does Dicey Rule 3 survive Brussels? That's a point of law. There's no fact on that. And as, as regards the second issue, which is whether this is a revenue law uh, issue for the, uh, rather than civil commercial, the findings that were necessarily there for the purpose of the ground one stand. Um, so, so what, whatever was decided, what, whatever the, was decided by Mr. Justice uh, Andrew Baker in relation to Ground One, uh, as affects my clients as to why this is a uh, uh, within Dicey Rule Three, that gets carried through into Ground Two, uh, and so th that, in my respectful submission, means that when your lordship comes to look at uh, at Ground One. There's been lots of interesting uh, issues about whether this is uh, patrimonial, uh, whether it's uh, the relevance of fraud, um, whether there's a claim for tax, and all those very interesting points. They don't concern me because they accept that based on uh, the claim as formulated against me, it fails because it's caught by Dicey Rule 3. And for my purposes, that's good enough. And, and that is all you need. That's, that's all you have, isn't it? I mean, we've you can't go around picking up paragraphs of Justice Baker's judgment and saying, well, that was part of his reasoning, and therefore everybody else can carry that forward. What you've got is a finding that you're, you're uh, within Dicey Rule 3, and that has not been appealed. Exactly. Uh, and I would also contend that the reasons that one can take from the judgment as to why we're within Dicey Rule 3, um, in other words, the question of, 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 of sovereign power and, excess and tax, they all get carried through into the, the question of uh, whether this is revenue or not. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I do pick up a number of features which we say are relevant when you consider 
the question of, of, of revenue. Uh, and perhaps I can just give those uh, uh, briefly to you by way of a list. The first, um, there's really six features. This is we why rely it's a revenue matter exists. Yes, but, but those are the points upon which we rely upon. The first is, the first is uh, at paragraph uh, 114, which is at CB1, tab 3, page 33, which is, um, although in the context of the, so it's, it's I'll just repeat that. It's, it's um, just coming. Yeah, 114, page 33. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, it's really the last three lines where it says that SCAP was and is acting as a Danish sovereign tax authority in the interests of the da Danish FISC and not as a private party could or might act. The central interest in pursuit of which SCAP brings these claims remains that of the taxing Danish company dividends properly in accordance with Danish tax law and DTAs a purely sovereign interest. So those are the points that was acting as a Danish sovereign tax authority was acting in the interests of the Danish FISC and not as a private party could or might act. Uh, and the six features, just to list them, the, the first and the reference there is paragraphs, I'm not going to go to them specifically, it's 76, 83 and 85, which is that the Danish Withholding Tax Act provides a foundation of SCAT's claims. Without it, SCAT's claims could not exist. The second is judgment paragraph 95, Taxation of dividends under the WH Act is in substance, quote, a single exercise of sovereign authority to take in tax in proportion of declared Danish company dividends. Three, judgment, paragraph 97. By its claim, SCAT is seeking to enforce its entitlement to keep as tax what is collected up front by the operation of a WHT scheme. Four, judgment, paragraph 98. SCAT's claim seeking recovery in respect of a tax refund payment made through error induced by misrepresentation by nature is, quote, conceptually and functionally the same as a claim for tax due and unpaid. Five, judgment paragraphs 102 and 107, that the real or central interest, and that's a quote, in SCAT bringing its claim against EDF man is to seek to repair the whole, and that's paragraph 102 where that phrase comes from, in SCAT's dividend tax take by, quote, collecting what was due to it by way of dividend tax for the tax years in question, unquote. And six, paragraph uh, 109 of the judgment, the legal relationship between EDF man applicant and SCAT was that of taxpayer and a sovereign taxation authority. And we say that the, 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 as against man, the position may be different as against the other defendants, the court cannot revisit any of these findings or characterization of SCAT's claim because they are, we submit, a necessary corollary of the ground one concession. So in our submission, the consequence of the ground one concession is fatal to SCAT's contention that man's claim is civil or commercial matter, and we say it means that the claim must be characterized as a <laughs> revenue matter outside the scope of the Brussels regulation. Can I just ask, ask how this arises? Because if you contend that this is not a civil or commercial matter, then that would have to be taken as a challenge to the jurisdiction. No, that, that, that's, a, that's a point, my lord. That, 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 that we, we've, no, no one, no one uh, issued what might be a, a, a CPR part, uh, 11. part 11. No, no one did. And no one has suggested that we needed to. Um, you can't, but you cannot now take the point, can you, that this it does not fall within the um, Brussels regulation if you did not um, challenge jurisdiction under Part 11. You're deemed to submit it, aren't you? Well, you did submit it. Well, that's never, my, my, well, that, that has never been said before. It's not been said by SCAD. And in my respectful submission, it goes against the, the notion that the, the rule three challenge is not to the jurisdiction. We're not challenging as such the jurisdiction of the, uh, of the English court. What we're saying is that the, the, the claim is, is inadmissible. I, I understand that, and I understand that you're arguing the rule, rule three. But my understanding is you're saying in the alternative that, it, that this doesn't fall, that this isn't a civil and commercial matter, 
but I'm not sure how that's opened. Well, well, but that, that would mean Andrew, uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker shouldn't have, been, shouldn't have given this judgment. Well, my Lord, with, with respect, the, the, the answer is, is that by submitting to the jurisdiction, that does not mean that, that, that we accept that the Brussels uh, regulations uh, are, are applicable to the case. So, my, my Lord, that... that What's the foundation of the jurisdiction? The jurisdiction, being, we, we've, been, we've been served here. You're an English registered company. We're an English registered company. We've been served here. But if... So, you, you, so it goes like this, does it? You're, you're served here, so the English court has jurisdiction. Uh, and so you say, well, Dicey Rule 3, and, and it seems to me going on Lord Goff's analysis, which would seem to be the one which we should follow, leaving aside what's been agreed between the parties. This is not a, um, a matter of... Rule 3 is not a matter of jurisdiction. It's effectively uh, judicial self-restraint, where the court has jurisdiction, but the, the claim is not admissible. Correct. So then... The, uh, so that's your case. The, respond, the, the claimant's answer to that is, well, um, actually, um, it's, it, it is a case in which the English court has mandatory jurisdiction as a consequence of the Brussels regulation, which, has, uh, which means two things. One is that it's a civil and commercial matter, therefore you're within Brussels. And two, uh, Rule 3 is gone, but it's been abrogated by... Article 1 of Brussels. Right. So the debate at that stage is not a debate about jurisdiction, it's a debate about the applicability of the regulation. That's correct. And that's how everyone's proceeded uh, throughout. I mean, the, the, I, was, I was not going to deal with the, the, the facts um, for the reason I've just given. I mean, I can go through the facts, but in my respect, so it would be inappropriate to go through the facts. Um, well, we're left with the conundrum, aren't we? So this isn't for you. Really, but we're left with the conundrum that if, if if Lord Paddock is right about the other defendants, there's a complete inconsistency between um, the judge's um, conclusions against the two sets of defendants. Like maybe that's explained by saying, well, the, the other part of the case is, is fraud and fraud is different, um, whereas the case against you is always negligence misrepresentation. Doesn't concern me. It's not doesn't mine. Concern you. Doesn't concern you. Exactly. So my, I, I'm entitled to, to stand here and say, um, um, for better or worse, they, they, accept, they have to accept. That, for um, whatever reason, yes. For whatever reason, you, you, you can rely on, on Rule 3 unless Brussels prevents you from doing so. Correct. So, so if I can then deal with the, sort of the, the second of the arguments that... that I know the Chancellor identified, namely the preclusion argument, and, and leaving over the question of, of jurisdiction, uh, or rather the revenue matter, to, to Mr. Palmer. Um, what I want to do is just deal with the argument under three heads. First of all, to address the judge's reasons for deciding that preclusion does not work. Secondly, to amplify why the judge's reasoning is correct on preclusion. So in, in effect, I will then just go through the points uh, in more detail. Uh, and then thirdly, to, uh, to deal with uh, the, the points made by SCAT that challenge the reasoning, which we've already dealt with in our written submissions, but um, th there's a few points that uh, I wish to pick up. I mean, the, the, the judge's core conclusion is a paragraph, if this can be put on the screen, at CB1, tab 3, at page 42, at 147. And, and that's on the screen. And the, the reasoning behind, you, you, you've seen, I'm not going to read it aloud. So yeah. Effectively, it's a, subs a substantive rule of law, unaffected by Brussels. Uh, and, and he agreed with the editors of Dicea and Morris. Uh, and the, 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 the reasoning underpinning that conclusion is developed in that paragraph itself, but in paragraph 148 to 161. And, and there are, in my submission, three stages in the reasoning. The first is, is that the raw and the, the regulation, Brussels, are performing different functions. Uh, the rule is a substantive rule of English law, 
not a rule about personal jurisdiction in the conflicts of law sense, and that he says that at 147, and that's expressed to be in agreement with Dicey. He also says, and this is the important as, as well, it's available to be invoked by a defendant amenable to the jurisdiction of the court when answering suit, uh, and that it operates as a substantive defense to a claim on the grounds of lack of admissibility, and that's at paragraph 148, uh, and the, the judge preferred to use that term, uh, to, and not justiciability to describe claims affected by the rule. And it's not about, and this is 147 again, which defendants can be brought uh, before the court to answer a claim of a given type. By contrast, the judge describes the Brussels-Lugano regime as, I quote, a common set of rules applying in all member states as regards personal jurisdiction, and that's paragraph 132. In the same paragraph, he makes the point that the Brussels rules do not go to whether a particular defendant can be sued, do go to whether a particular defendant can be sued in a particular court. But the Brussels rules, and, and this is a paragraph 134, are not about the harmonization of the substantive laws of member states. And so the judge therefore drew a distinction, which is reflected in 147, uh, between rules of personal jurisdiction under Brussels with the substantive nature of the dicey rule three. So the first stage in the judge's reasoning was therefore to conclude after comparing the rule and the regulations that they are functionally different. The second stage in the judge's reasoning was his conclusion that there is nothing in the brussels Lugano regime which excludes the application of the revenue rule to a case which is classified as a civil or commercial matter under Brussels, and that's paragraph 150. He expressly disapproved Lord Justice Simon Brown's um, contrary um, uh, obiter view in Franson uh, uh, at 149, uh, and concluded at 149 that the brussels Lugano regime does not touch the question whether Dicey Rule 3 applies so as to defeat the claim. So that third stage, and the third stage is that for the purpose of uh, EC law, the revenue rule is to be characterized as a choice of law rule, which is overriding or mandatory at paragraph 147, uh, and that similar, similar points are made at 148, 156, and 175, which he describes it as an overriding rule of English law as a lex fori, and it takes effect under article 16 of Rome 2 even if the governing law is not English. And that's obviously important in terms of why it's so important. It applies irrespective of what the law is uh, governing the cause and issue. And that's at one final It's an interesting one. thing, isn't it, that, that, that if, if the revenue rule were, and, and one way of looking at it is, to, is to, that it's, a, it's, it's part of a sort of wider concept of um, public policy, that English courts will, will Certain claims are not admissible in English courts as a matter of public policy. I mean, it's, it, it's well established that that the Brussels Lugano regimes don't touch upon public policy of the national courts. Yes, and and and, and the judge did refer to it as, as falling within uh, public policy, yeah. and it's quite easy to see why it does fall within public policy. I mean, it's been re repeatedly referred to as as a fundamental rule of English law. Um, in the Privy Council in Webb and Webb in 2020, it was referred to as a, as a common law principle. And we can see that it's been, from, particularly from the speech of Lord Gough, that, that it's followed in many other countries and, and, and the submissions of Mr. Palmer deals with its sort of international scope. Uh, and, and it's easy to see that it is a, a, a matter of public policy. Um, that the revenue authorities are not allowed to exert an extraterritorial jurisdiction in this country. Uh, and um, in my respectful submission, when one comes to look at the consequences uh, of, the, of, of what's being said, coming back perhaps to the point I was making in the beginning, it would be, we submit, highly surprising uh, that the, 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 the English court comes to a conclusion that the, the, the Rule 3 
this rule that's been around for so long. And the Revenue Authority rule goes back to Lord Mansfield, even before Lord Mansfield, uh, according to uh, uh, academic writings. Uh, it would be very surprising that the English court would uh, countenance that, particularly in a context where the Brussels regulation doesn't deal with, with revenue. There are no rules that they've, they've, they've identified. The only relevance to, to, to revenue is in the definition of what is a commercial or civil matter. There is actually no set of rules in Brussels allocating where, uh, where um, revenue type claims could be brought, which is the point that, that Professor Briggs brings up in his article in 1999, dealing with Franson. Uh, which, which is referred to by the judge um, in, in, in his judgment. So, so we submit coming. So, those are the we submit the, 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 the basic structure of, of, of what the judge's reasons are, and, and we say that each stage is correct. The first stage is that the rule and the regulation are performing separate functions, uh, and that is the judge's characterization of the rule as a substantive rule of law as opposed to a rule about jurisdiction of the English court to hear a claim. So that's the distinction between a substantive rule of law uh, and a rule of jurisdiction to hear the claim. Uh, and that, that was the orthodox view, uh, and it was agreed by the parties. And if we could put sev uh, judgment paragraph 17.1, uh, CB1, tab 3, page 7, on, on the screen... Um, that the, where it says that Dicey Rule 3 is not a rule of jurisdiction, despite the language in which it's articulated. It is a substantive rule of English law, leading to the dismissal of claims falling within it. And that was uh, a high-level point of principle which is agreed and which, which sta stands. And, and, and this view, not be a rule of jurisdiction, but a substantive rule, we submit is critical to the analysis uh, and it's perhaps just worth mention, reminding the court how it operates. It's shown from the, uh, uh, the dicey passage that we've looked at uh, is what Lord Goff said in the, in the Norway case uh, that your lordship has already seen. Um, it's also, uh, there is an analogy, perhaps not precise, but there's an analogy between the way the revenue rule works and the act of state works, and we've cited in our submissions um, the Mohammed uh, and MOD case, in which Mr. Justice Leggett, uh, at first instance, uh, made the observation that the act of state rule seems to be him analogous to conflict of law rules, that the English courts will not enforce the penal revenue or other public law of a foreign state. Uh, and Baroness Hale referred to that analogy without dissenting from it. And she described in the Supreme Court, uh, paragraph 45, that the act of state doctrine is clearly a rule of substantive law rather than a procedural bar. Uh, and also in Belharge, um, Lord Mance described it as a substantive bar to liability or adjudication. Lord Sumption called it a rule of substantive law, which operates as a limitation on the subject matter of the jurisdiction of the English court. So, so that's the... The, the key point there is, is that the revenue rule operates as a substantive defence rather than a jurisdictional uh, or procedural bar. And, and the, the third point in this kind of list is that that's exactly how the, the, the rule operates. Um, uh, it, it was raised uh, in the defence. The, the English court had assumed jurisdiction, case managed it, uh, and the revenue rule can be dealt with even at trial. Uh, and, and I think the Buchanan case was a case where, where it was dealt with at trial. Uh, and, and, of course, the preliminary issue in our case is about whether SCAT's claims are inadmissible. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of the, the framework for um, Rule 3. When it comes to the, uh, the Brussels regulation, we can see that it operates on a different plane and has a different function to the revenue rule. It's a set of rules determining, that is, member state claims are to be brought. And, and you get that from Owusu, uh, and that's at paragraph 39 to, to 40, um, where, where and 39 says it's laying down common rules of jurisdiction to guarantee certainty as to the allocation of jurisdiction among Sorry, the various... 39 to 40 of what? Uh, of, of Owusu. 
it's a, it, yeah, if we can get PA 8, tab 31, page 9. So PA 8. PA 8, tab 30, sorry, 71, 71 at, at page uh, electronic 9. Hopefully that will be. So if we can just look at um, 39, that was a passage, and then paragraph 40, the court has thus, thus held, um, and going on to, uh, should be interpreted in such a way as to enable a, norm, a normally, a normally well-informed defendant reasonably to foresee before which courts, other than the state, where he, may, where he may be sued. So it's this point I was making between jurisdiction, which is about courts, which courts you can go to, uh, and admissibility, which is about claims. Uh, and defences. And of course, one can see a wusu, um, how it might be said that the Forum Convenience Doctrine operates a similar function to the Brussels regulation because it allows courts to determine, and as a matter of discretion rather than mandatory rules, where a claim is to be based. But like Brussels regulation, it operates within a different sphere to the revenue rule. Uh, and I'm repeating myself, but the revenue rule is about substantive rights, not their procedural entitlement to be determined in a particular court. Uh, and of course, the analogy between the revenue rule and forum convenience doctrine, which is relied upon by my learned friends, is in act as a judge held, and that's a judgment uh, paragraph 148. Uh, and if we can just get dicey on screen, uh, PA 11, Tab 105, page 22. So PA 11, tab 105, page 22. And um, if we can just go back one page, let's go to the bottom. And um, last. Uh, few lines, it is suggested that the principle in Awusu, and then turn over please, does not affect the rules relating to matters which have hitherto been regarded as non-justiciable. Uh, and then there's a reference to the Butts gas case. Is a convenient moment for a break? Yes.
stage one, the rule of the regulations dealing with different functions, uh, and the, the, we've looked at uh, looking at Brussels, uh, and the point to make here is that Brussels is not about harmonising substantive domestic law, and that was a, a point made by the, the learned judge below at paragraph 134, and it's a point that we make in our skeleton at paragraph 51 by reference to the Sherville case. Uh, and um, there's a number of cases which show, underline that Brussels is not intended to impinge on substantive rules of domestic law. The Chevron case. Yes. 
Uh, and also, w w there's, a, there's a, in our skeleton of paragraph 53, we refer to the Messier Doughty case, a decision of the Master of Rolls Royce Wolf, about how the jurisdictional rules of Brussels do not prevent, for example, an English court awarding summary judgment on the merits. Uh, and then there's the Carrington case, which makes it clear where Sir Lancelot Henderson emphasized uh, the, the rule of interpretation of ensuring that uh, there was compatibility uh, involved the least possible interference with na national substantive law. So in summary, we say that the judge's characterization of the distinct functions of the revenue rule as a substantive rule and the Brussels regulations as a set of rules identifying the courts for which claims can be brought was orthodox uncontroversial and correct. Now, as I understand um, my learned friend's argument, certainly the written argument of paragraph 84, they don't challenge the judge's characterization of the revenue rule as a substantive rule of law. Instead, they assert that it makes no difference as to whether it impairs the effectiveness of the Brussels regulation. But with respect, it cannot be right that the respective functions performed by the revenue rule and the regulation are irrelevant to whether the principle of effectiveness is engaged. The functional interaction between one and the other is in our submission crucial to that question. The judge was therefore right to proceed by seeking to establish the realms in which the rule and the regulation operated. The second stage, which we say that the judge was correct, is that the, the, the judge's reasoning was that there was nothing in Brussels, which purports to exclude the application of the revenue rule to a case falling within the regulation. And that's paragraph 150, uh, final sentence. Uh, and that conclusion is based on his distinct, uh, the, the distinct functions of the revenue rule and the regulation. Uh, and it's right uh, at this stage that at paragraph 150, the judge was particularly dealing with the effect of uh, Lord Justice uh, Simon Brown's over to comments in Franson. But I think your lordships have already got the points about Franson. Essentially, there are three. The first is, is, is the context, that it's impossible to escape that by the time it came to deal with preclusion, the Court of Appeal in Franson had already decided that Brussels could not apply to an indirect claim to recover taxes. In other words, the type of claim that lies at the very outer reaches of the revenue rule. And the Lord Justice Simon Brown's judgment, indirect rules such as Buchanan, case that claims such as Buchanan, I quote, plainly fall within the compass of revenue matters as that expression would be understood by all member states for the purposes of Article 1. So the effect of that conclusion was that the revenue rule could never uh, impair the operation of, of, of Brussels a claim caught by the revenue rule would always be outside it. And it was against that background that Lord Justice Simon Brown posited to himself the question whether the revenue rule to a, in a claim which was not a revenue matter could impair Brussels. But that question we submit was artificial because on his own reasoning, the posited eventuality could never happen. Cases on the outer reaches of the rule and therefore all court cases caught by the rule would always be revenue matters outside Brussels. The second point is that we submit with respect that there is inadequate reasoning to support the conclusion that the revenue rule would impair the operation of Brussels for uh, the ent entirely hypothetical and unreal scenario in which cases applied fell within Brussels. Uh, and your Lordship seen the, the judgment. I'm not going to uh, look at it, but. But in my respectful submission, what he appears to be doing is looking as if there is, in fact, uh, uh, the revenue rule is operating in the same way as the question as to whether a case could be brought before a court in the same way as Brussels. In other words, he's treating it as a rule of jurisdiction. Can I just pick up on one thing? The second point is that we submit with respect that there is, I think you meant to, to say, and I heard, inadequate. What I meant to say is, is that, the, that, that there's inadequate reasoning on the part of the, the judge. That's it's what I meant to say. The transcript had picked you up as saying and adequate reasoning. No, inadequate. My, my mistake. I, I apologise for that. Yep. 
And so once it's, once it's established that the rule is substantive, not a rule of jurisdiction set out in the Brussels regulation, we submit there's no basis to support the conclusion that the revenue rule would impair the effectiveness of the Brussels regulation. And that's the point I made earlier. And then the third point is the point made by Professor Briggs in his critique of the judgment after it came out that was cited by the judge. And your Lordship has seen that, um, where he says it's inconceivable that uh, Lord Justice uh, Simon Brown was correct. Rather extreme, but uh, uh, there it goes. Um, and he goes on to say, there was never any plausible chance that an English court should have been asked to enforce a Danish tax law, which is what's happening here. But anyway, so paraphrasing Professor Briggs, what, what, what he's saying is that if it was truly the intention that Brussels would should abolish the rule, revenue matters would have been made subject to an ex, the exclusive jurisdiction of the court of the taxing state, uh, and that hasn't happened. So that is um, the, uh, the point there on what I want to say about Franson. The, the next point is, is the, what I'd call the, 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 the circumstances in which the UK acceded to the, uh, 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 to the Brussels Convention. The cross-reference to our skeleton is paragraph 51. Uh, and rather than take you, your Lordship, through it in, in, in detail, what I just want to, 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 to bring across is that the revenue rule has always been fundamental. And as Lord Goff said in the state of Norway, and I quote at 808H, it is deeply embedded not only in the common law, but also in the law of civil countries. Dicey, paragraph 1132, says that it's the general principle found in most countries that foreign tax laws will not be enforced. <coughs> so when one comes to look at the Slosser Report, which, is, 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 uh, which devotes pages to explaining the genesis of the revenue exception um, and goes through the features, three features of the law of the United Kingdom um, and, and, con and considering whether they are consistent with uh, um, the, the Brussels regime. The third of those is the discretionary powers enjoyed by the courts to determine territorial jurisdiction. In other words, the, the, the uh, doctrine of forum non-convenience. So the Slosser Report therefore delineates features of English law whose existence were threatened by the UK accession. Notably, they are procedural, not substantive features and they did not touch upon the operation of the revenue rule. So we submit that the Slosser Report therefore supports the argument made by Professor Briggs by reference to the language and the scheme of the regulation that it has nothing functionally to do with the operation of the revenue rule, a rule of substantive uh, law. Uh, and my point is this, is that if the uh, Rule 3 was affected by uh, uh, Brussels, at the very least that would have been mentioned, uh, and clearly in our submission that that was not uh, even considered by Slosser, uh, and, and I submit correctly, because they are operating uh, with different functions and in a different plane. Now the third stage is, is that the rule is an overriding mandatory... The, the, the logic of having uh, amended the wording when we went at our accession, accession of, of the UK and, and the Republic of Ireland was that uh, was to in, ensure that th that uh, claims by revenue authorities were excluded from Brussels because they would have been excluded under civil law systems because they'd be uh, claims um, uh, in relation to public uh, public law matters uh, and of course the concern when we joined was that we unlike um, jurisdictions like France where those matters are dealt with by an entirely separate court system, culminating in the Conseil d'État. You, uh, this court, these courts, had the administrative court, which was part of the Queen's Bench Division. So, um, you know, there was always the potential for an argument that it was still a civil matter, even though it was a public law matter. That yes, was I mean, the, that was the that was, and, and so part of the part of the thinking, one one um, deduces, may very well have been. 
to, to ensure that the revenue rule was preserved. Yes, exactly. I mean, Lord, Lord Panic uh, told us um, that the term uh, revenue in Article 1.1, a reference to, I think, the case called Tiard, was not to limit or um, the scope of civil uh, and commercial matters, but was only meant to be um, clarifying um, what, what it was covered. It wasn't there to make a fundamental change, mm. to take away um, this fundamental principle of English and the common law. So, so the, the, the third stage is overriding mandatory provisions. Uh, and that, that was the third stage, was in the judge's reasoning, was to tie up how the revenue rule is to be characterised within EU law if it does not fall within Brussels. Uh, and the judge, uh, paragraphs 161 to 162, resolved any compatibility issue between Rule 3 and EU law by treating the rule as a choice of law rule applicable under Article 16 of Rome 2. And this categorization of Rule 3 as a choice of law rule of the forum is, is correct in our submission. The effect of the revenue rule is that the Lex Fori alone governs claims falling within the rule, and, and that it is a mandatory rule which enshrines the English court's choice not to enforce foreign revenue laws in support of claims brought um, in this jurisdiction. Um, your Lordship should note that SCAT does not challenge the judge's finding that the revenue rule is an overriding mandatory provision uh, of, of English law. Uh, its contention is that that is not relevant uh, and um, uses the phrase even if, and the reference is there at their skeleton at 84, 113, and 113.2. So, summarising, we conclude that the judges, we submit that the judge's reasoning uh, and his rationalization of the function of the revenue rule and its relationship with EU law cannot be impeached. We say that the revenue rule and the Brussels regulation are functionally different. And we say that the revenue rule takes effect outside Brussels. It has nothing to do with where to sue. It is a substantive choice of law rule. Now, the, 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 the points that are made by SCAT, um, I think I've got about 10 minutes, so with respect, I'm going to take it quite quickly. Um, first of all, can I make it clear we rely on everything we said in our written argument? Um, and the arguments that we, that we have to meet are about the incom alleged incompatibility of the rule with Brussels and the argument that the rule impairs the effectiveness of the, uh, of the revenue rule, rule uh, uh, and well, rather, yes, it impairs the effectiveness of the regulation. Um, and we say that there is a short answer to both arguments, and that's the argument that I've just made, which is that the revenue rule and the regulation perform different roles and operate on different plans. To use the language of SCAT's skeleton, they are not functionally equivalent because at paragraph 89, they say they're functionally equivalent. The rule has no function to perform for the purpose of allocating jurisdiction, uh, and which, in other words, which court to hear. And it's to a substantive rule to be, to be deployed after jurisdiction is, is determined. And this absence of functional equivalence means that there is no prospect of incompatibility. Um, I, I, if I may, I just respond to the to the, the main points made by my learned friend, Lord Panic, made orally, uh, and there are really four points that he made. The first is the argument that the rule and Article One are dealing with the same things, uh, and he described that as his main point. Uh, and on our submission, that that uh, is I've already dealt with, um, and it's the there is a clear dividing line, um, and. Um, what we say he does is to blur the line, and what he says is he seeks to, where well, he seeks to do this, to say that the criteria governing the application of the rule and the engagement to the revenue exception are sufficiently similar to suggest that they are concerned with answering the same question. With respect, that that's a false logic. What it fails to recognize is that the similar criteria may govern jurisdictional and substantive questions, but it does not follow that the questions are uh, functionally uh, identical. 
uh, and that's borne out um, in the European jurisprudence. Uh, and there are two cases that we would invite um, your lordships to look at. The first is the Rena case, uh, which is referred to in SCAT paragraph 92, and the Supreme Site case, which is referred to by SCAT in, in, in paragraph 91. And in both those cases, the issue for decision was the threshold jurisdictional one. In other words, whether the sovereign features of the claims meant that they fell outside the civil and commercial umbrella. Uh, and what one gets from those uh, two uh, authorities is the, um, the rejection of, the, of, the, of, a, of a jurisdiction argument did not touch upon the continuing availability of, of, of in, that, in the first case, of a substantive immunity defense. Uh, and you get that from the Advocate General's uh, opinion at paragraph 128 in the Rena case. Uh, and uh, in our su submission, what this case shows is that there is a room for substantive sovereign immunity defense to, to exist within the Brussels but yet it to remain as also substantive um, under the, within the same regulation. And the same applies in relation to the Supreme Site case, where, where uh, that distinction is made between uh, establishing jurisdiction under Brussels uh, and then the question of the substantive merits. And we say that there is an analogy um, of, as to the way that the sovereign immunity defense that was run in those two cases and the revenue rule apply. These are substantive defenses which fall to be determined after the jurisdiction question where the case is to be heard. Um, now, moving on, there's, there's, a, there's another um, fundamental uh, objection to ascribing the revenue rule exception as the same function uh, as, as, the, as the rule. Uh, and that's, in our submission, involves a misdescription of the revenue exception. Uh, and again, it comes back to the point that I made earlier, um, is that it's not dealing with jurisdiction, which is what Brussels is concerned. And then there's a whole series of cases dealing with procedural rules. Uh, and of course, we accept that the operation of pro domestic procedural rules like forum non convenience can interfere with the allocation of jurisdiction under Brussels. But we're not concerned in our case with the operation of a procedural rule but a rule of substance. So there is no analogy at all. Uh, and the Viking case cited by my learned friend is an example of the operation of a procedural rule interfering with the regulation. And, and the other cases cited by SCAT at paragraph 96 are in the same line and they have no uh, issue. The second point to, to, to cover was the point made by my learned friend by reliance on Lucasfilm. Um, we've dealt with that um, in our written uh, argument, and I don't propose to, to look at it. But, but what is important when one comes to look at Lucasfilm is not to look at the, 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 the remarks made by Lord Walker uh, and Lord Collins at the end of that uh, in terms of what possible arguments in relation to an act of state case. But what we would invite your lordships to do is to look at the Court of Appeal decision which is directly in point uh, and, and makes it quite clear that the arguments that we are maintaining uh, are, are the correct one. Uh, and you will see in the, uh, the Lucas film, there was a rejection of some kind of extra U EU jurisdiction, um, which was uh, uh, dismissed by the uh, Court of Appeal uh, and um, in our submission is, is directly uh, in point. Um, as to his references to the passages in the Supreme Court's judgment about the Mozambique rule, um, in our respectful submission, that has no bearing in this case. One is dealing there with a provision in European law, which is expressly dealing with a, an issue in Mozambique, the question of title to land and whether that is justiciable and, and how that fits in with uh, English domestic law you do not have in the context of the revenue rule anything approaching any similarity because there is nothing in the Brussels regulations seeking to invoke a special rule relating to, uh, 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 to revenue in the same way that there is in Lucasville. 
film dealing with copyright infringement, which, which is covered in, uh, or, or yes, in, in Brussels regulation, and therefore there there is the, uh, it's it's it, it is not an authority that bears any resemblance on the issue that you have so to those, consider. Those are examples of special jurisdiction. Exactly, Those which is not here. or land expressly dealt with in the convention or in the regulation. And there's just nothing equivalent in relation to... to exactly, that's the point in relation to Lucasfilm. Um, and so the, the only other point um, that was made was the discrepancy in outcome. Um, I think this was uh, the... Uh, yes, the, the difference of application to questions of jurisdiction and enforcement. But I think the, yesterday morning, Lord Panic seemed to have abandoned this argument as a freestanding point, uh, and I don't propose to, um, to say anything more about it, but for your Lordship's note, we deal with it in paragraph uh, 61 uh, of, uh, of our submissions. And um, the only other point um, that was dealt with by my, my learned friend was the assertion that the rule cannot operate as an overriding mandatory provision because it is operated in an order, uh, in an area which is full, fully harmonized, uh, and to which the answer there, and that was the reference there, was the Pipig case. Um, but that was the case about inconsistencies between an EU directive on misleading advertising and national rules. It was therefore a directive explicitly dealing with substantive laws. Uh, and it's miles away from the present case, uh, which, um, where our case is where the rule and the regulation do not operate in the same realm. The regulation has nothing to do with substantive laws, and there is no interface between the harmonization of jurisdictional rules and substantive rules. So the Pipping case really provides no basis to object to the judge's categorization of the rule as an overriding mandatory rule uh, under Article 16, Rule 2. Well, I said I was going to finish at 12.15, and I'm finishing. Unless I can assist your Lordships. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I was ungrateful. Um, I appear for the SMB defendants, who are four individuals, three of whom appeared in person in the court below, one of whom did not appear and was not represented in the court below. But uh, dividing the topics between us, as we have heard, my submissions before my lords are going to focus on the issue of whether the claims are civil or commercial matters within the meaning of Article 1 of Brussels. And my preliminary point, which is a framing point, I know it's a point well understood by my lords, is that SCAT's ground two must assume and proceed on the basis that contrary to ground one, the claims against the defendants, or at least some of them, do fall within dicey rule three. Because if, uh, and to the extent that any claim against any defendant is not barred by Dicey Rule 3. Well, then Ground 2 adds precisely nothing. Ground 2 is academic, other than in relation Completely to... Completely academic to the extent that Ground 1 succeeds. Other than, other than in relation other to... Than ETF, which all, ETF, Ground 1's already conceded, effectively, yeah. put it that way. So it, it's only to the extent that my Leonard Van Panic cannot get home on Ground 1 uh, uh, and cannot evade Dicey Rule 3 the ground two comes into play at all. So for the purposes of assessing and testing the arguments on ground two, uh, my lords have to proceed on the assumption uh, that the claims which are before my lords and are being dealt with under ground two are those which have survived ground one, are those which do fall within dicey rule three. Uh, and my short submission, my central submission to my lords, which I apprehend is a, is a welcome one from what has been said so far, is uh, that to that extent, the claims, the fact that, that any conclusion that the claims are barred by Dicey Rule 3 dictates the answer on Article 1, 
uh, they cannot be uh, civil uh, or commercial matters if they fall within WC Rule 3. That's my central submission to which I'm, that's my, my last point first, if you like, and then I'll see where I'm, uh, I'm going. Um, <coughs> um, so it's important that when one assesses Rod Paddock's submissions, particularly on the application of the test, when I say he's misstated the test under, under Russell, but whatever the test is, when one applies it, one has to apply it with holding in mind that the fact that these are revenue claims so far as WC Rule 3 is concerned for whatever reason that may be. Uh, and if I'm right on this point, uh, then at least so far as my own friend Mr. Malik's uh, clients are concerned, and everything that Mr. Malik has said on the issue of preclusion would become uh, unnecessary uh, and indeed overturned, just as it was in, in France, in fact, to be I'll be doing the same admission uh, from Justice Simon Brown in that respect. So uh, may I start by identifying uh, the judges uh, analysis uh, to which my submissions are, are targeted. Uh, I, I must have dual targets because I, uh, I apprehend that Lord Panic's analysis in fact differs uh, from the judges. But, uh, I must show, first show you how the judge handled this issue. And yeah. I can do that quickly because I know my lords have seen it. But I'm going to suggest to my lords that it boils down into two limbs. The first begins in the judgment uh, at paragraph 144, uh, and that is in core bundle one, tab three, page 41. Where the fundamental premise uh, on which the judge proceeds is that you begin by focusing exclusively on matters of form, in the Brussels and characterizes the conclusion in Sunico as a conclusion essentially that because the claim was framed in tort and not as a claim against under tax law, the proceedings were civil and commercial. The emphasis on how the claim is framed there in tort rather than uh, as a revenue matter, not looking at the substance. Of course, on his analysis under Dicey Rule 3, if one looks at the substance, it is a tax matter, but he says, EU is different, you look uh, uh, at uh, the form, uh, and that is continued at 149, which is uh, two pages on, page 43. No, uh, so, I'm sorry, I have different pagination. Sorry, it's at the bottom of page uh, 42. Mm -hmm. uh, for which he therefore concludes that Franson no longer binds him if that's inconsistent, and this is all subject to one proviso, which is the second limb, to which I'll come to in a moment, which is what he calls the use of public powers point. So this is his starting point. Uh, and then through 150, 151 on the next page, where you see the contrast in the middle of one paragraph 150 between what he regards as a rule of substance under Dicey Rule 3 and... Um, uh, looking beyond the way in which a claim is framed, whereas Brussels Lugano is formalistic. So the SCAT accepted. Uh, uh, and a claim may be in substance revenue, but nonetheless civil and commercial. Uh, and that's pursued through into 151 uh, again. And then on page 46, which is where his heading actually begins under civil and commercial matters, or when he actually turns formally to this topic, he refers back uh, to his previous uh, conclusions, and again begins with, in point of form, uh, Scats commenced ordinary civil litigation and has pleaded only private law uh, causes of action, so subject to the use of the public powers qualification, that means this is civil commercial, uh, and again he refers back at 164 to his earlier conclusion that Franson is no longer uh, good law. Uh, and he does explicitly say uh, uh, in 164, second sentence, in short, if Franson remains good law, to the effect essentially that revenue matters within Article 1 of Brussels encompassed any proceedings in which the claim fell foul of Dicey Rule 3, well, then the position would be different. 
my orders that that is going to be my submission to you. That is precisely the point of Franzen. It's not overruled. It's not inconsistent uh, with Sunico and with EU law generally. Uh, and then the conclusion is different uh, as per Franzen if you're within dicey rule three or if you're outside civil commercial matters uh, for Article one. So that is the first limb of the reason. It's all subject to a caveat which is subject to what he calls the use of public powers point. And that's the point he deals with in the immediate subheading further down the page from paragraph 165. Uh, and there is, in fairness uh, to the judge, at Roman 1, uh, a reference to what in due course I will submit to my lords uh, is part of the real true test, which is... Um, to uh, focus on identifying the legal relationship between the parties and to examine the basis and the detailed rules governing the bringing of the action. But thereafter, the entire analysis is focused on what I'm going to characterize as the secondary test, identifying the primary test in a moment. But there are two tests which are expressed in the jurisprudence to be alternatives to each other. The secondary test, if the primary test doesn't lead to the conclusion that you're outside Brussels, is to look at whether, uh, uh, for example, information gathering powers have been used, and then that information gathered has been used in the proceedings. And that is the point arises for the first time um, uh, in Sunico, but then Lord Panic says is, is developed onwards in Buak uh, and Murich. My lords will remember that point. And so the judge's analysis is once you get past the, the simple question of form, that's the reservation, the Buak Murich points, are public powers being used so as to advantage or put the public authority in a different position to a private party in the litigation, so that the rules of litigation are changed in favour of the public authority. Uh, and that, he says, um, is, the, is the point, uh, and he says that pursuant to Molich, uh, it's, uh, it, that, that is a necessary part of that test, that the rules are changed, uh, and that's not the position here. Now, my lords, um, uh, my submission uh, to you is uh, that that is uh, wrong, um, that the primary test is to ask whether the basis of the action is either a right which arises from an exercise of public powers or a legal relationship characterized by an exercise of public powers. And this is a test of substance and not a form. And in the present case, at least, it will yield the same answer as Dicey Rule 3. Uh, and the secondary test, which operates as an alternative, if that test, that primary test, means that you're in a private claim, uh, as it were, a totally analogous position as between two, two private parties pursuing uh, a private cause of action in the civil courts, then you ask, well, nonetheless, is there some, within that litigation, is there some exercise of public powers which privileges the public authority? They can use uh, their public powers, for example, uh, to require evidence to be obtained. Uh, and that's a second sort of gateway out of Brussels. Uh, and my further submission is that these tests, and in particular that primary test, uh, is to be inter interpreted and applied in the light of public international law which the EU jurisprudence itself consciously reflects. 
uh, and it's the same principles of public international law which underlie Dicey Rule 3. At root, it's the fundamental principle of territorial sovereignty. My submission to my office is it's that principle which informs Dicey Rule 3 and it informs the distinction between civil commercial versus revenue, etc., uh, within Brussels uh, as well uh, to the same uh, effect at least. Uh, I don't need to say that the two tests are in all respects identical. It would be theoretically possible uh, for there to be a wider scope of matters which fall outside civil commercial for Brussels purposes than fall outside uh, Dicey Rule, uh, fall inside Dicey Rule 3. But I do say that anything which is captured by Dicey Rule 3 is necessarily excluded from civil commercial uh, for the purposes of Brussels. <coughs> And, and a further point of contest before I embark on making those submissions good by reference to the authorities, it, and it's an important point of context, is that, of course, as the court is well aware, Article 1 of Brussels has to be given the same interpretation whether the claim uh, against an EU domicile defendant it, is brought by an EU member state uh, or by uh, a third country, such as Russia, for example. That we know since Oruzi. Uh, it's an important uh, point of context to bear in mind the consequences of, of how the issue uh, divides as between civil commercial or, or not. So uh, let me turn then uh, to the correct test. Uh, and again, in identifying the test, uh, Lord Panic effectively, as did the judge, banks everything on Sunico. So Sunico is the rule that makes the difference. Uh, and when my lords put these points, uh, put, well, asked Lord Panic about these points on the afternoon of the first day, uh, which is my lord, Lord Justice Stuart Smith's fundamental difficulty that he expressed, you know, how can something be within Dicey Rule 3 but outside, uh, uh, but, but within civil commercial? Uh, uh, lord Panic's answer was well, because Sunico imposes such a high test. Straight away accepting in practice that it is a substantive test, uh, and indeed he directed submissions to the substantive test, and he didn't like the judge to say, well, it's just a question of form subject to public powers uh, in terms of evidence gathering. Uh, but my submission is that Sunico does not represent a departure from the principle, first of all, that the test is one of substance, and secondly, uh, from the what I have called the primary test. So I will show you predates Sunico, goes through Sunico, and postdates, and is affirmed post Sunico. And Sunico doesn't represent any kind of a departure and should not be read as having overturned those principles in favour of a test based on form. And I make that point because some of the academic commentary, which the judge referred to in his judgment, which came out shortly after um, Sunico, I think within a year or two obviously without the benefit of subsequent case law, simply reduced Sunico to the same proposition that the judge did, which says, well, now it's just a matter of form if you've got a claim in tort. Um, yeah, that's essentially it. You're, you're a civil commercial uh, matter. <clears throat> so let me start in the review of it, just to highlight what I'm going to do. I'm simply going to go through in chronological order just to show you the authorities, the key authorities, to show you how this principle has developed and what the words which end up inevitably in normal court of justice fashion, the formulas which tend to get repeated and repeated, but just to give substance to their origin, uh, to understand how this really is a rule of substance, and having established that, what that rule actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to start, before I go through chronologically, I'm going to start at the end point, which is the most recent case, just to show you how it has ended up. Uh, so my lords can have that in mind throughout as we go through the development. And that is the Supreme <coughs> Site Services case, uh, which is at PA 10, tab 86. And I'll come back to the, to the facts of this later when we, when we go in chronological order, but I want to start with the 
uh, opinion and advocate general Oak, which is uh, at page 16. Because <laughs> the advocate general conducts a review of the uh, case law up to that uh, point uh, and starts summarizing the conclusions which may be drawn from paragraph 82. Mm -hmm. And you see for 82, you can see uh, something similarly expressed, although not identically to the proposition I call the primary test, which is called settled case law. The question is whether an action is excluded must be assessed on the basis of the elements which characterize the nature of the legal relationships between the parties to the dispute or the subject matter thereof. Uh, then at 83, thus the court has held that although certain actions in the public authority persons governed by private law may come within the scope of the regulation, this is not so where the public authority is acting in the exercise of its public powers. Pausing there, I'm going to show my lords that that is not simply a reference to what the judge below called the public the use of public powers exception. It's far broader. It underpins the legal relationship and subject matter points. Uh, then continuing, the exercise of public powers by one of the parties to the case, because it exercises powers falling outside the scope of the ordinary legal rules applicable to relationships between private individuals, excludes such a case from civil and commercial matters. Uh, these are the authority cited, which we're going to see. Uh, but again, you'll see that's not so restricted to what the judge called use of public powers. It's wider than that and goes to the substance. So to determine whether the court whether that's the case, the court has held it's necessary to identify the legal relationship between the parties to dispute and to examine the basis of and the detailed rules governing the bringing of the action. Uh, and as a reference there uh, to uh, Tiard, and we're still in substance terms, but in due course, these words get expanded to include the Buak Movich principles of use of public powers that cannot be reduced uh, to that point. Now, an important context then follows uh, uh, over the page, continuing in paragraph 84, uh, in the light of that case law, it would appear that those three criteria, legal relationship between the parties, basis of the action, and detailed rules governing the action, should be examined cumulatively. However, some judgments make no reference the criterion of the legal relationship between the parties to dispute. Moreover, in other judgments, the court has dealt with the criteria relating to the legal basis of the action brought and the legal relationship between the parties as criteria which overlap, looking at Sunico. So it seems to me that the court doesn't draw a consistent distinction between the legal relationship between the parties, but the basis of the action brought and the subject matter of the dispute. All of which is a polite way of saying to the court, my lords, the uh, previous jurisprudence is a bit of a mess and needs some sorting out. Uh, <laughs> 85. They never, say, they never admit it, though. Do they, they don't. Even, but that is, in fact, the key point, my lord. And you'll see they use a form of language because they never admit it. Well, that, that, that's one of the problems with, with CJEU decisions. <laughs> yes. they, they, they continue to recite the same verbal formulae. They do, uh, and when they when they move away, or when they when actually uh, for an English court would just say, well, the, the, our previous decision was wrongly decided. Yes, at least the Supreme Court yes. or might. Um, right. They they never say that. They no. always find some way of kind of el eliding the point, which is well, why it's sometimes very difficult well, to well, interpret well, cases. I well, was exactly right. In fact, what happens to Sunico, as we'll see, it gets yeah. gently like I mean, it's it's it's, it's fleeting. I can't say there's an express <laughs> disapproval or anything like it. No. It, no. it is fleeting, but it sets things back on the proper track yeah. in the knowledge that it has under, been understood more widely as focusing on form. It, it sets things back straight away on, on the question of substance and pretends that's been existent all the way along. But, but I'll come to that. Well, it's but, very interesting isn't it? because it, <laughs> instinctively one would say whether or not something is a civil or commercial matter, it should surely be a matter of substance yes. rather than a matter of form. Exactly right. But we're all right. Uh, <laughs> And indeed, that is what the case law actually does. And Sunico is misread and has been misread because it is a, I may say, a poorly phrased uh, judgment. I don't have to go so far as saying it's wrong on its facts, but it is poorly phrased and it has led to misunderstanding, including by distinguished commentators. 
but um, there we are. Uh, and so 85, beyond the details of the reasoning of what by the court in most judgments, it seems to me that ultimately the decisive factor is that the basis of the action is a right which arises from an exercise of public powers or a legal relationship characterized by an exercise of public powers. And that's the formulation which I adopted in my submission to you. This is the Advocate General, not the court, of course, one bears that in mind. Uh, uh, going on to say the court has held, going back to Rufa, which I'll be showing you, the fact that in recovering costs, the administering agent acts pursuant to a debt which arises from an act of public authority is sufficient for its action, whatever the nature of the proceedings afforded by national law for that person, for that purpose, to be treated as being outside the ambit of the Brussels Convention. And that is cited here because it is explicitly acknowledging that it is a question of substance over form. When we get to Rufa, you will see that is a claim brought in tort to the private law action. Uh, the court said it doesn't matter, that's irrelevant, you look at the substance. Um, and 87, in my view, that case law also highlights about the criterion relating to the detailed rules governing the action is not relevant in all cases. The detailed rules governing the action, that's when you get into the Gruak Mogic point. And the reason why it's not relevant in all cases is because when you look at the substance of the matter, you might already have decided that this is not a civil commercial matter in substance. And that you see reflected uh, in 88, uh, the fact that the action uses the classic forms of civil law cannot prevent it from being excluded from the scope of the regulation where it can be established in the light of other factors that the basis of the action is a right which arises from an exercise of public powers or a legal relationship characterized by an exercise of public powers. And uh, I consider it necessary to emphasize that the criterion relating to the detailed rules governing the action was introduced by the judgment in Barton uh, and reproduced in Sapir uh, and Sunico this is the judge's use of public powers point, in the specific context of disputes in which, in the light of other features, the basis of the action did not appear to be a right which arose from an exercise of public powers or a legal relationship characterized by an exercise of public powers. And here's why, in order to prevent situations where the body governed by public law would have the option to adopt a public law measure which is enforceable in itself, and would therefore have powers which allow it to avoid the rules of ordinary law nevertheless being included in the scope of, of the regulation. So that's the Burak Mogic point there. So that's the uh, uh, Advocate General trying to steer the court back onto uh, terra firma. The uh, judgment uh, is at page 33. Paragraph 55 to 58. <coughs> and uh, there you see at 55, uh, referring to the uh, criteria identified in the case law in order to characterize whether or not an action is civil commercial, it must be pointed out the court has examined the elements which characterize the nature of the legal relationships between the parties to the dispute or the subject matter thereof, and then after the citations, or alternatively, the basis uh, and the detailed rules governing the bringing of the ap uh, action. Uh, and there's a, a reference to Sunico, uh, the second one. So a primary test and an alternative secondary test, as explained uh, by the Advocate General, Continuing, thus, although certain actions between a public authority and a person governed by private law may come within scope, where the legal proceedings relate to acts performed jure gestionis, the position is otherwise uh, where the public authority is acting in the exercise uh, of its public powers, in other words, uh, jure imperium. Uh, the exercise of public powers by one of the parties to the case, because it exercises powers falling outside the scope of the ordinary rules applicable, the relationships between private individuals uh, excludes such a, uh, such a case. So uh, more condensed reasoning, but clearly setting up 
two alternative test, case uh, tests, the basis for it. And the first being one of uh, substance. So that is the most recent word on the matter from the, uh, the uh, court. Uh, and my lords, with your leave, I'm going to uh, take you back in time now uh, to see actually how these principles, these rather summary references to legal relationship and subject matter, how they were born and what they actually refer to in substance. Uh, so my lords, the first authority, the earliest one is the LTU case, which is a SRA 4, Supplementary Respondents Authorities Bundle 4, uh, tab 38. <coughs> it's LTU, or sometimes known as uh, Euro Control. Shortly on this, it, it's um, Euro Control uh, brought an action against LTU to recover route charges which had been imposed on owners of aircraft for the use of air safety services. And uh, a question referred was uh, whose law under Brussels, uh, conventions it then was, was to be applied in determining whether this was a civil and commercial matter. So the basis upon which it was referred, it was assumed that this all fell within Brussels, uh, but it wasn't clear at that time whose law should be applied. Uh, sorry, it was, sorry, it was assumed that the question of whether it was a civil and commercial matter was a matter of domestic law. So the question was whose domestic law. Uh, and if we go to page nine, uh, please. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I'm going to go on to this, uh, 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 page 14, in fact. I'm going to go on to page 14 uh, for reasons of time just to see uh, the test which is applied. Because the court, as the Lord Mills will know, said that this is a matter of community law, not of domestic law, what is civil and commercial matter, and that has its own autonomous meaning. So at paragraph 4 of the judgment, at the top of that page, Um, they say if the interpretation of the concept is approached in this way, that is on the basis of autonomous meaning in EU law, that certain types of judicial decision must be regarded as excluded uh, from the area of application, either by reason of the legal relationships between the parties to the action or of the subject matter of the action. For although certain judgments given in actions between a public authority and a person governed by private law may fall within the area of application, this is not so where the public authority acts in the exercise of its powers. There's the origin of that statement. Uh, and now we'll give it color. Such is the case in a dispute which, like that between the parties to the main action, concerns the recovery of charges payable by a person governed by private law to a national or international body governed by public law for the use of equipment and services provided by such body in particular where such use is obligatory and exclusive. And this applies in particular where the rate of charges, the methods of calculation, and the procedures for collection are fixed unilaterally in relation to the users. So of course in substance, this was just a claim for a debt uh, in form. I mean, that's the basis of the action. You've incurred these charges. The court says, well, these are uh, provided by a public authority on a compulsory basis, not the product of individual negotiation between the parties, it's laid down uh, as a matter of public law. Uh, and in those circumstances, that that's relationship between the parties takes you outside uh, the um, uh, Brussels, because as we can see, if we go down to the bottom of paragraph five, last four lines, Concluded that this is not civil commercial. They say on the basis, four lines up from the bottom, on the basis of these criteria, a judgment given in, in an action between a public authority and a person governed by private law, in which a public authority is active in the exercise of its powers, is excluded uh, from the area of the application of the convention. So there we see the principle uh, born. Uh, 
the next authority is I've mentioned already, it's RUFA. It's an SRA 4 tab 39. Go straight to page two. The, the facts uh, were, is uh, from the bottom of page two, uh, there was a motor vehicle, vessel uh, owned by Mr. Rufa, uh, which sank. Uh, and we go to the top of page three. On the basis of the provisions of the Dutch Wrecks Act, the Netherlands state had the wreck uh, of the vessel removed, brought alongside. Uh, it was sold, what was left of the broken cargo was sold, uh, and the proceeds were remitted to the state uh, to recover all the costs. And so the Netherlands state claimed the balance from Mr. Rufer uh, under Section 10 of that Wrecks Act which gives the agent responsible for administering the waterways as removed and wreck a right of recourse against the party responsible for the shipwreck, wreck, uh, which was uh, 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 Mr. Rufa, uh, and he was uh, summoned. The question referred was, uh, is this a civil and commercial uh, matter? Uh, in his uh, opinion, uh, Advocate General Warner, page six, please, middle of the page, just under that quote, in reviewing section 10, that was section 10 of the Act, reviews that and explains uh, that uh, what is stated in the order of reference is it appears that liability referred to in section 10 is liability under the general law. In this instance, according to state's claim, liability under Dutch commercial code imposes on the owner of the ship vicarious liability for damage caused by the wrongful acts of those employed in the course of their employment, uh, and which relates to torts. Uh, at all events, the Hoga Rad expressly states the state's claim against Mr. Rufa is to be classified in Dutch law uh, as a claim uh, in tort. Uh, now, all parties agreed, uh, as appears on page 8, This was a civil uh, commercial uh, matter, uh, treating it as a tort claim. The court is going to put him right on that. Eight, yeah. This is still the Advocate General's opinion, it's bottom half of the page. Uh, all, all agreed uh, that the question was yes, this is civil commercial. The court ruled against them on this, but just to look at the arguments of the parties, because they're informative. Uh, the state uh, said, well, this is a claim in tort, so we weren't acting as a public authority exercising our powers as such, so as to bring us within LTU. The argument of the commission was slightly different, and the commission accepted that in removing a wreck, the public authority was exercising public powers, in the sense meant by the court. It didn't, however, follow Commission submitted an action based on Section 10 was an action brought in the exercise of public powers. So the Commission drew a distinction between the prior act, what in substance the matter related to, what this claim arose from. We said, well, that's an exercise of public powers, but now you're just claiming a debt that's brought in, in, in tort, uh, and uh, that's civil commercial, said the Commission, not so the court. Uh, they rejected those arguments. So page 21. Uh, paragraph 8. Recites the test, the public exercise of public powers. Uh, and 9. Such a case is an action for the recovery of the costs involved in the removal of a wreck in a public waterway administered by the state responsible in performance of the international obligation on the basis of provisions of national law, which confer on it the status of public authority in regard to public persons. Uh, and then 10, uh, common ground in this case, had the wreck removed, uh, consequently acted in this case as the body invested with public authority, 
at 13 of the page. The fact that in this case, the action pending for the court doesn't concern the actual removal, but the costs, and the Netherlands state is seeking to recover those costs by means of a claim for redress, not by administrative process, as provided for national law, cannot be sufficient to bring the matter in dispute within the ambit of the Brussels Convention. And then moving down to 15, the fact that in recovering those costs, the administering agent acts pursuant to a debt which arises from an act of public authority is sufficient for its action, whatever the nature of proceedings afforded by national law for that purpose, to be treating as outside the ambit of the Brussels Convention. So we look at the London Eye Act as an exercise of public powers which gives rise to the debt, no matter what the form of action thereafter is uh, to uh, recover it. This is not civil uh, commercial. So the substance, not form, and uh, the dispositif, which is on the next page, in the middle of the page, uh, just sums that up. You can see that it doesn't include actions such as that referred by the court uh, uh, to recover the costs incurred in the removal of a rep carried out by or at the instigation of the administering agent in the exercise of its public authority. Uh, and this is still uh, the principle as we'll see. So Sontag is the next case. I'll squeeze that in before the adjournment. Uh, the cases become, in some respects, repetitive. And I want, if I may, with the court to take them uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so this was a claim sorry, for damage. Uh, Sontag, I'm so sorry. It's SRA 5, uh, tab 44. And it's uh, page 20. And if I just give you the facts briefly for context, this was a claim for damages by the family of a German schoolboy victim of an accident on a school trip in Italy. Uh, and the action was brought against the teacher who took the boys on the trip. Uh, and he was found in the criminal courts to be guilty of negligent homicide. And that court also had the jurisdiction to impose a civil consequence, a payment of damages, uh, on that teacher. And the defendant argued, no, no, this is a public law claim, perhaps optimistically. But the basis upon which he argued that that was a public law claim is because he was supervising those pupils in his capacity as a holder of public office. He was a state school teacher. Uh, and he said, well, that's therefore a matter of administrative law, and that won't be at all surprised to hear the court rejected uh, that argument. Uh, and you can see uh, from paragraph uh, 19, uh, this is civil in nature. It's a civil claim for compensation. It's civil in nature. So they start with that substantive, looking at what it is, uh, and at uh, 20, reciting the tests. Uh, and at 21, he said, look, although he's acting on behalf of the state, a holder of a public office doesn't always exercise public authority powers, and he was doing this in his duty of organizing, directing the activities of pupils during a school excursion. That's not a manifestation of a public authority power, and it's such action not pursuant to powers which are exorbitant by reference to rules applicable in relation between private individuals. So in all relevant respects, he was in exactly the same position as a private school teacher, that's 23. Of course, that's the genesis of this principle that you have to look at not just simply is this a public authority, but is it actually exercising uh, public powers in the relevant sense? Does the subject matter of the dispute arise out of exercise of public uh, powers uh, by someone who may formerly be uh, in a, a public uh, office in this case? But again, all looking at the substance, uh, not the form. This was the form here was a criminal action generating a um, a uh, claim for damages, uh, that's the genesis of it, that's still civil and commercial because uh, enforcing that claim for damages and upholding that claim for damages uh, is the stuff of a civil claim uh, for negligence uh, in ordinary way. Uh, 
um, I can just squeeze in largely before uh, lunch, which is the genesis of what the judge called the use of public powers test. It's at SRA 5, tab 47. You can take the facts from the head note. Okay, this is a divorce uh, background. Uh, and importantly, the first sentence there, on the divorce of the defendant and his wife, it was agreed before a notary that no maintenance would be payable between the parties. Wife and child settled in the Netherlands, where they received social assistance from the claimant local authority. The claimant brought an action in the Netherlands for recovery from the defendant of the amounts paid under its right of recourse in legislation, which also provided inter alia that such right was not to be precluded by an agreement between spouses or former spouses, excluding or limiting uh, maintenance. And the court at page 19 Paragraph 29 to 30 proceeds from Euro control and RUFA principles uh, and says at uh, 31 uh, <clears throat> uh, in order to determine whether that's so, I uh, exercise public powers looking at legal relationships and subject matter uh, in a case such as that in point in which a public body seeks from a person governed by private law recovery of sums paid by it by way of social assistance to the former spouse and the child of that person, it's necessary to examine the basis and the detailed rules governing the bringing of that action. That's the genesis of that statement, which is subsequently repeated. And you'll see here it's looking at the substance of the matter initially. 32 we recall that it appears from relevant law, Dutch law, that the costs of social assistance are recoverable up to the limit of the maintenance obligation under the Dutch civil code. And thus, it's the rules of the civil law which determine the cases in which the public body may bring an action under a right of recourse, namely whether there is a person under a statutory obligation to pay maintenance. So the obligation is uh, the ability to recover is coterminous uh, with the statutory maintenance obligation uh, itself. So 33 does concern form. It notes that the action must be brought between before the civil courts and that it's governed by the rules of civil uh, procedure. But at 34, what is done is an uh, um, examination of the substance, which is that this is a right on, of subrogation, in effect, the legal situation of the public, person, public body vis-a-vis -vis the person liable for maintenance is comparable to that of an individual who, having paid on whatever ground another's debt, is subrogated to the rights of the uh, original uh, creditor. Uh, and at uh, 35 to 6, uh, therefore, so, so far, so civil, they say, however, that finding calls for some qualification by reason of Article 49, under which an agreement between spouses or former spouses for the purpose of precluding or limiting their maintenance obligations after their divorce does not preclude recovery from one of the parties and is without prejudice to determination of the amounts to be recovered. To the extent to which that provision allows the public body in a proper case to disregard an agreement lawfully entered into between spouses or former spouses, producing binding effects between them and enforceable against third parties, it places the public body in a legal situation which derogates uh, from the uh, ordinary law. I'm just pausing there. So if this had been simply a matter, someone was meant to be paying maintenance, Dutch state steps in, in their shoes and pays it and seeks to recover, that's civil, commercial, it's purely private in nature. It's my condition in, in subrogation. But as soon as the state says, no, we're going to override those private Rights, well, then that's exercise of public powers. It's no longer uh, civil, commercial. Now, I take time on this only because, as I say, the, the formulation which captures that principle is the formulation I showed you a moment ago uh, in um, paragraph uh, uh, 30. Uh, uh, what's it now? Um, uh, 31, the previous page, paragraph 31. 
you can clearly say this is looking, you can clearly see the application of this rule is necessary to examine the basis and the detailed rules governing the bringing of that action is here being used to look at the substance of what is going on. Is it just a simple right of subrogation being done or are the public authorities' powers actually being exercised so as to overrule by the bankruptcy? This is not the use of public powers point, which the judge fixes on, but it is the origin of that statement. So it shows that those, those words examine the basis and the detailed rules governing the bringing of that action can apply <coughs> to the substance of the matter. I'm going to stop there now because I realize we're a couple minutes over one, and I'll pick up if I may. Well, I think for half an hour, I think I have 33 minutes before this. Well, we'll so five minutes <laughs> through two, two, five minutes. Then you've got 28 minutes. 28, <laughs> thank you. Don't rise.